Okay. Now again, just to remind you, 如果教到一半完全你听不到声音或者完全真的是很 lag， 记得跟我讲。All right. 呃，直接 send 一个 message 给我讲。OK， 我听不到你讲东西，或者你在 WhatsApp 给我讲，因为昨天也是这样子，同样的事事情发生。Okay, so you have, you have to let me know b e c a u s e otherwise I don't know, I don't know at your end how you experience it. So I can straight away I can stop the stop the lesson and see how it goes, how how we decide, right? So you have to let me know. Right. Let's without further delay, let's continue with the lesson. Let's continue with the lesson. Okay. Today talked about. Newton's law of gravitation. <clears throat> okay, now when we talk about gravity, right? Let's imagine. Uh, let's give a scenario. Gravity is the force of attraction between two masses, right? Between two masses. Now. There are many misconception, okay, misconception or confusion, misleading information out there because people think that gravity is a force that is acting in one direction. Let's say I have two masses. This is bigger mass and we have a smaller mass. Okay, they are separated a certain distance, right? This one we call it R. Okay. Now many people think that the smaller mass It will experience a gravity gravitational pull by the bigger mass. Okay, in other words, the bigger mass is pulling M2 towards itself, right? So they think that the gravitational force is one direction, meaning that this arrow here, the blue arrow, I label the gravitational force. So it's like only M2 is experiencing the gravitational force, and only M2 is moving towards M1. Okay, but In reality, right? According to the Newton's law, what he found out, this is not the case. Okay. So what is actually the case, right? Is two object will experience the gravitational force, right? Regardless the mass of the object. Okay. Even though m1 is bigger, but m1 will still be pulled towards m2. All right. So the point is that gravity acts. Between two bodies, okay. Gravity acts between two bodies. Not one body, not only one is two. Meaning that M1 will tend to move towards M2, and M2 also will tend to move towards M1, right? And in fact, this gravitational force, ah, the magnitude is the same. Okay. So if I write down here, both bodies experience the same. Magnitude of gravitational force. Okay, so if you see now in re, in practically right, you you will you will see that m two will move towards m one because it's smaller mass, right? It's smaller mass, so it will move towards m one. So many people think that okay, since m two is moving to m one, then m two must be experiencing a greater gravitational force. No, right? No. It's the same, right? M1 is also experiencing the same amount of gravitational force. But why M1 is not moving is because this this a、uh, huge mass of M1, right? The gravitational force does not have a parent effect on the on the mass movement. All right, I repeat the I repeat what I say because M1 has huge mass, so the gravitational force does not have a parent effect on its movement. Right now, it's the same concept as the the leaf falling off of a tree. Okay, just imagine like on Earth, right? The leaf falling down to the ground. This one, right? Okay, because of gravity, right? So at the same time, when the leaf falls down, gravitational force is pulling the leaf towards the Earth. But at the same time, Earth is also experiencing gravitational pull towards the leaf. Right, but if you it, this one sounds ridiculous, right? Because it's impossible that impossible that the Earth will move towards the leaf, right? It's it sounds ridiculous, but in fact, according to Newton's law, it is it is like this. It is like this. So the Earth is also experiencing a gravitational pull towards the leaf, but because the girl the Earth has a huge mass, so that 
the movement is almost negligible. Right? So I, the idea is this, these two points. Okay. Now let's continue with the uh, next one. Now, what Newton found out is that Newton Jiang Sumo Hajang. There's two things that Newton say. Okay. First is that he, he, say, he says that the gravitational force is directly proportional to the product of the two masses. Meaning that F directly proportional to M1 times M2. Okay, so if I have two masses, M1, M2, and any of the masses, are, if it increase in mass, for example, M1 increases mass or either M2, either one, it is going to affect the gravitational force pulling each other. Okay, so this is basically what it means. Right now, second thing that Newton said was the force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance, meaning that F inversely proportional to one over R square. Okay, this means that when the two object moves further away from each other, it is going to have a reduction of the gravitational force. Now, in fact, because you see there's a square here, right? So when you a square, this is also neither R for every unit of R increase, it is going to have much greater reduction on the force. Because you have a square, right? So here you, you will get like a exponential graph. F and R, right? So it's like like this. So so when R gets larger, the reduction in the gravitational force will become even more because of the square. Mathematically, okay, you can see that, right? So, in other words, is each unit increment going to have a bigger reduction of the force? Now, these two things Newton said, if you combine these two, then you get what? You get the universal law of gravitation, which says that the gravity, the gravitational force equals to the G, M1, M2, divided by R squared. If you combine that these two things that he said, right now, what is the G stand for? G, G is the gravitational constant, and we always use the same, which is six point six seven times ten to the power of negative eleven, and the unit is net Newton meter square kg minus two. Okay, looks complicated. The unit looks like a monster. Okay, never mind. Don't later later because the unit you can straight away derive, my right. You can derive the unit, no need to memorize the unit one, right? So this constant, this one no need to memorize, this, this one is given, okay? In exam is given, right? Okay, so G is constant, and then you have two masses, right? So these two masses, M1, M2, and be careful, this uh, R is from the center of mass. This is if I have two masses, M1, M2, this is from the center of M1 to the center of M2. Okay, many people make the mistake is that they take the distance from the surface. This is from here. Surface to other surface. No. Right? You have to make sure that you are taking the distance from the center to the center. Alright? Now, this is the formula we are talking about. So what is this formula used for? What is this formula used for? What does this formula tell you? Okay, so this formula basically it tells you that any two bodies, it can be anything, any two bodies of masses uh, M1 and 2 are going to experience a pull by each other. Doesn't matter anything on any object on the universe, as long as they have mass, then they are going to experience a pull by each other. Okay, take an example. Even if you're standing beside your friend, right? You're standing beside your friend, you have mass, and your friend also has mass. Okay, so you two, technically, you two are going to experience this gravitational pull as well. All right, but why do you, why do you don't feel it? Because your mass is too small. All right, your mass is too small if you compare with the mass of the earth. So this formula is used for big masses. 
like planetary object, celestial object, celestial body in the universe. All right. So that one is going to have a more uh, effect on the gravitational pull. So you don't you don't feel the gravitational pull by standing beside your friend. So let's say if you want to calculate, like, let's say like, okay, if you want to calculate what is the gravitational force attracting you and somebody standing beside you. Let's see. Okay, now let's take the average uh, mass of a person. Okay, so this is you and this is your friend, right? You're standing at one meter. So let's say you're 50 kg and your friend is 60 kg. Okay, so the gravitational force equals to G mm over R squared, right? So G 6.67 times 10 to the power of negative 11. Then you times 50 and 60 divided by one square, you will get, I think, two times 10 to the power of negative seven Newton. This is like 10 to the power of negative, it's like 0 0.000. It's like almost negligible, right? It's like almost negligible. So the mass has to be very huge to have an apparent effect. Okay, now, next one. Okay, so Newton's law what is what does the Newton's second law tell you? You still remember? Newton's, Newton's first law says that inertia, right? An object that's, that is moving, it tends to move forever if there's no external force disturb it. That is Newton's law number one. Newton's law number two, he says that F equals to MA, right? F equals to MA, MG, FTR, right? WTR. Okay, let me erase this first. Let me erase this first. Okay, now, so from Newton's second law, F equals to MG. So this one is the gravitational force, or you can call it the weight of an object. Let's say I have an object on the earth. This is the earth, okay? So the weight of the object is the gravitational force and it's equal to the mass times the G, right? This is what we learned before. So this one, since you already know what is the universal uh, formula for gravity, gravitational force, F equals to G, Big M, now ta M is the mass of the Earth, right? Xiao M is the any object uh, on the Earth, right? So ta M and xiao M, and then R squared, right? This, this two. So this F is equals to this F, right? Just this one is more general formula. So I can equate them to mg equals to g m m over R squared. And then the mass of object, I can just cancel out, right? And then I will get this one, G equals to GM over R squared. And this is the second formula that you need to know, right? The first one is this one. The second is this one. So G, G is what? G is the gravitational acceleration, right? assume the objects on the surface of the earth. All right? I repeat, constant on the surface of the earth. So if you are dealing with astronomical scale, meaning that all the planet and satellite, rockets, all the stuff, right? They are going to have different G because they are further away from the earth like much further, right? So actually, if you draw the graph of this one, right, you will see this one. This is the, the graph, so it looks like this. G is the y-axis, and whole R is the distance away from the Earth, okay? So remember this one, R is always measured from the center of the Earth. Now. Let's draw the diagram here. This is the Earth. And then let's take the center 
to the surface of the earth as the radius r okay so this capital r stands for uh, the radius of the earth right so if you see this graph here this peak value uh, this peak value here this is 9.81 and it is at the radius of earth okay so the distance at a distance that is the same as the surface of earth you have a g of jude by e this is the surface now what is this uh this section here the the red shaded region you see that from here right here is zero zero is like at the center of the earth here from the center of the earth just imagine you are going from the center of the earth going outward okay slowly you approach the surface of the earth you are, you are going from the inner uh, inner core the center right so from here as you go to the surface of the earth the g will increase okay so you see this part of the graph this part of the graph is it will increase here right as you go from zero to the radius of the earth the gravitational acceleration will increase why because it is inside the body that is generating the gravitational field okay so this part actually it is directly proportional we say that the gravitational acceleration is directly proportional to the distance now tang ta tau of the surface the source to the jude by e mad bude ran ho tang ta li kai of the surface or as it goes further uh, from the surface uh, further 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 apart then the g will slowly decrease 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 you see this one inversely proportional so it's like sloping down all right so in other words all objects that is at a certain altitude from the earth they are experiencing a lower gravitational acceleration right so at the at the right side of this graph here we say that the gravitational acceleration is inversely proportional to the distance okay the distance here all right now so what is the use of this one what why, why do we want to uh, know this one uh? <clears throat> okay so this formula actually gives you uh, allows you to calculate what is the gravitational acceleration at different point okay at different point uh, not only on earth can be any planet the moon the sun and anything okay now how do we calculate using the formula so let's say uh, i give you an example okay let's say uh, I want to find this one is planet. Okay, I'm standing right here, point A. So what is the gravitational acceleration or so-called G I am experiencing at this particular point in space, right? So again, we write out all the notation from the center of the earth until the surface is the radius of the earth okay or radius of the planet whatever planet that is and then from the surface to my location is the height right we label the height so g equals to gm equals to r square equals to to find the g we have the gravitational constant the mass of the planet divided by this r is the total r is from the center here all the way to here this is the r okay it's from the center all the way to my location so here is many people make the mistakes here because they straight away they take the r as the hatch okay for example the altitude is uh altitude is 20200 km straight away they take 20200 km as the r no you have to plus the radius of the earth right you have the radius of the earth so this is uh, using the formula to find this one now let's take a quick example of this one okay uh, let me type it out okay 
radar imaging satellite. Okay, just, just to show you uh, one example, one simple example. Okay, so a radar imaging satellite orbits around the Earth at a height of 480 km. What is the value of gravitational acceleration at the position of this satellite? So it's pretty, straight, pretty straightforward. Okay, G equals to Gm divided by R squared. So equals to gravitational constant 6.67 times 10 to the power of negative. 11 okay and then times the mass uh, the mass of the earth okay so how much is the mass of the earth uh, it's not given here okay let's just take a let's just take the mass of okay we change this to moon we change this to moon right because it's not given in my question here so i got the mass of the moon so let's say the mass of the moon is uh, 7.35, 7.35 times 10 to the power of 22 kg. Oh, all, all of these are in SI unit. Huh? Okay, this one, this kg, this one is in meter. So divided by the square of the distance. Now this square of the distance, you have to take the radius of the moon plus 480. So 480,000 meter plus the radius of the moon, and let's say it is 1.74 times 10 to the power of 6. Let's say it's this one, uh, right? Then you calculate and then you get the answer. Okay, roughly like uh, 8 point something, 8 point something or 9 point something. Okay, okay, so this is how we find the, the G. So as long as you got the mass of the planet and the distance where you want to calculate, then, should, then you can. You can get the G. Okay, so so far we have learned about two things, two formula, right? The gravitational force, universal gravitational force formula, and also how do we determine the gravitational acceleration, right? Now I'll move on to the next part. I'll move on to the next part. I'm going to clear this. Okay, next we look at this one, centripetal force. Okay, let's take, again, we start with an example. Okay, this is the Earth. And then we have the orbit. Okay, now, let's draw a satellite here. So here, I draw three positions of the satellite orbiting the Earth three positions, let's say A, B, and C. Now, how does, first, uh, let's imagine, let's imagine, how does the satellite move? Okay, it's a dumb question, right? The satellite, of course, it moves in circular motion, right? It orbits the, the Earth. But, but where is the direction of the speed? Where is the direction of the speed? The direction, the speed of the satellite is forward, okay? It's forward, it's moving forward. So, in other in other words, I can draw it like this. This is the speed, okay? It is tangential to the circle. So this is your circle. The speed is like tangent to the circle, touching one point, okay? So at position B, the speed is like pointing here. And at position C, is like this, here. So different positions of the satellite and different direction of speed. So the satellite actually, it orbits the, the Earth, right, at uniform speed. 
okay, at uniform speed. This speed, right, forward speed, we call it the linear speed. Okay, the tangent, tangential speed is the linear speed. Now, the question is, here is the question. If the satellite is moving at a, lin a certain linear speed forward, why is it not escaping the orbit of the Earth? If it's moving at a forward velocity and it's accelerating, okay, uh, it, uh, no, sorry, it's not accelerating, it's moving at a uniform speed forward, why is it not slowly moving away from the Earth and instead it kept in orbit? Okay, maybe your answer is because there is gravitational force, right? In your teasing league, keep that in orbit. Now, if there is gravitational force, then how come, how come the satellite won't spiral down to the Earth? It's like, if there's gravitational force, right, why the satellite won't get sucked towards the Earth? And it is still able to keep in orbit, like forever. Why? <clears throat> just think about it for a moment. No need to answer me. Just think about it for a moment. Okay. So the question is that why is the satellite not being thrown outward or sucked towards the Earth and it is able to maintain the altitude? Is it able to maintain this distance from the Earth? It has something to do with the centripetal acceleration. All right. So let's imagine like this. This is the Earth. I draw it again. Huh? And this is the orbit, right? This is the orbit. Let's say this is the object. Okay, I just draw it round up because easy for me to label the forces. I just assume it round shape, right? The satellite. Round satellite. All right. So since it is moving forward, so I label V forward. So it is accelerating forward. So this one is we call the acceleration, the centripetal acceleration. Later I'll explain what is that. Okay. Now, centripetal acceleration forward, why does it why is it able to keep in orbit? Is because this this acceleration here is equal to the gravitational acceleration. Okay? Okay? So you have acceleration, centripetal acceleration equal to the gravitational acceleration. And that is why it won't move away and also it won't move inside into the Earth atmosphere. All right. So in other words, we can say that the gravitational force pulling this object, pulling this satellite, is equal to the centripetal force. There is this centripetal force pulling the object towards the Earth. All right. Now, to understand this force, let me give you another example. Let me give you another example. Okay. So imagine you take a spring and then you attach it to a pendulum, a pendulum, okay? You swing the pendulum like this. This is the motion that, okay? Again, let's take three positions. So first, second, and third. Okay, so this is the, this is the pendulum at three different positions, A, B, and C. All right, now, can you label all the forces? Okay, let's label the velocity first. Where is the linear velocity of the pendulum? Pendulum is moving forward, so the linear velocity is like this. V, at point A, it is like this. Tangent to the circle, okay? At point B, it is like this. Now, what kept the pendulum in circular motion is the centripetal force. Okay, in this case, it is equal to the tension of the spring here, the green arrow I draw. Okay, so this is the century force. Okay, so you can think of centripetal force like this. It is the force that kept it in motion to allow the pendulum to move in uniform speed. All right, so for satellite, for this, just now, the, the example just now for satellite or any orbit, 
It can be the satellite orbiting the Earth. It can be the Moon orbiting the Earth or the Earth orbiting the Sun. Okay, for all these objects, the centripetal force is equal to the gravitational force. All right. So in other words, the gravitational force kept that keep them in orbit. Now, talk about the centripetal force formula. F equals to m v squared over r. Okay. So this is the centripetal force. It depends on the mass of the pendulum. Okay, this mass is the mass of the pendulum, and the linear velocity. This is the linear velocity. All right, not angular velocity. Angular is like uh, spinning, the the spinning velocity. All right, linear is straight, straight. Okay, linear velocity, and divided by this is the radius. Okay, the radius from the center of the pendulum all the way to the center of this circular motion. Now, let's, if I want you to cal calculate, what is the centripetal force pulling this pendulum? Okay, let's use the formula, okay? Let's say the mass of the pendulum is 7.2 kg, and then the velocity is 20 ms minus one. Okay, so this is the linear velocity and the radius is 1.8 meter. So it's straightforward. F equals to 7.2 times 20 square divided by 1.8. And then you'll get 16,000 Newton. Okay, so this one is the force that is pulling the pendulum and keeping it in circular motion. So what happened if you remove if you sub, suddenly the the split the, the string uh, snap it will move it will be thrown forward right it will be thrown forward right so if you take out the centripetal force straight away the object will be thrown forward okay at that instant uh moment the direction that it is moving in it will keep on moving that way okay now uh we send the link now join the then we will continue the lesson there.